Hello, and welcome to the Victoria Forum. I'm Saul Klein, Dean of the Gustafson School of Business at the University of Victoria and Chair of the Victoria Forum. Established in 2017, the Victoria Forum brings together change makers in the search for solutions to the pressing problems facing our people and our planet. The Victoria Forum will bring together uh, policymakers, business leaders, academics, youth community groups, non-governmental organizations, and indigenous communities to generate ideas for a better world. We are at a time right now where humanity is facing critical environmental problems. With the pandemic that we are currently facing, we are seeing a change in the climate as humanity is being forced to live a cleaner and healthier life. We have given Mother Earth a chance to heal, but we need to continue our efforts to protect and preserve her, not only for our own sakes, but for our future generations. Our discussions are intended to be evidence-based and inclusive of different perspectives, but united by a common purpose of wanting to make a difference. As our country's chamber of sober second thought, the Senate is a perfect partner for this enterprise. I am delighted to be part of the advisory team uh, that is putting together the Victoria Forum. And I very much look forward to these discussions and look forward to your participation. I hope we can all look forward to continuing the conversation and developing solutions for a better world at the University of Victoria. Thank you. Bien, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, welcome to this uh, bi-weekly webinar. J'aimerais vous souhaiter la bienvenue au webinaire uh, du Forum uh, de Victoria. Je m'appelle Sébastien Beaulieu, je suis le co-président associé uh, du Forum et il me fait grand plaisir uh, de vous souhaiter la bienvenue. My name is Sébastien Beaulieu. I'm associate co-chair of the Victoria Forum and Canada's ambassador to uh, Senegal. Um, today's webinar is... Uh, on a very important topic uh, once again, uh, climate displacement and development uh, perspectives on and from Asia. Uh, on a le, le bonheur uh, d'avoir un excellent panel aujourd'hui sur uh, l'enjeu clé qui est le climat, le développement et les déplacements, une intersection uh, très importante sur laquelle on aura au cours des 90 prochaines minutes l'occasion de, de jeter un regard éclairé avec des perspectives particulières de l'Asie et sur l'Asie. Le Forum de Victoria, c'est un partenariat novateur entre l'Université de Victoria et le Sénat euh, du Canada. Et il nous fait grand plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui. Uh, the Victoria Forum is a great partnership between the University of Victoria and the Senate of Canada. And once again, uh, welcome to today's uh, great conversation. Sans plus tarder, uh, j'aimerais vous souhaiter uh, un très bon, de très bons échanges et passer la parole à la sénatrice Mary Lou McPedrin. Alors, sans plus tarder, à vous, sénatrice. Merci. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to step in for a moment. Uh, merci beaucoup, Ambassador Beaulieu. Et bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, welcome, everyone, to th this final uh, webinar in the Victoria Forum uh, series. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives, uh, known as CAPI. My name is Victor Ramraj. Um, CAPI uh, is deeply immersed in many of the issues canvassed in this webinar series, including uh, divides caused uh, or exacerbated by climate change and uh, economic and gender inequality. In today's webinar, we explore some of these ch challenges and how they play out in Asia. Uh, with its population of 4.5 billion, Asia is home to 60% of the world's population, and it will soon require three quarters of the world's energy. Uh, it has uh, overall a young population that is increasingly well-educated and entrepreneurial. Uh, at the same time, it's densely populated uh, river deltas in uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and Bangladesh are particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels that increase the salination of fertile lands, threatening livelihoods and communities. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Himalayan glaciers in countries such as Bhutan are melting rapidly, leading to even more floods and landslides. Historian and novelist uh, Amitav Ghosh once declared that 
the continent of Asia is critical to every aspect of global warming. Its causes, its philosophical and historical implications, and the possibility of a global response to it. With those words in mind, uh, CAPI has partnered with the uh, Victoria Forum for today's webinar to examine the climate crisis in Asia, various governmental responses to it, and the role of gender and development policies in addressing it. And so as uh, Ambassador Beaulieu uh, mentioned, uh, to help us navigate the, these issues, it great, gives us great pleasure to introduce uh, our moderator, the Honorable Senator Mary Lou McFedrin. Uh, before her appointment to the Senate of Canada four years ago, Senator McFedrin was a professor who founded the Institute for International Women's Rights and specialized in human rights while continuing her work on women, youth, peace and security, and gender justice as a pro bono lawyer. Formerly with the Center for Global Studies, she is also an invaluable partner uh, at CAPI, uh, having recently co-hosted our virtual uh, roundtable on justice for the Rohingya in May of this year. I can't think of anyone more suited to uh, chair today's session. Uh, Senator McFedrin, uh, at last, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ramraj. Merci, Ambassador Beaulieu, et, um, to our University of Victoria hosts and my colleagues in the Senate of Canada for this collaboration. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin First Nation, land on which the Parliament of Canada is situated. And as an independent senator from Manitoba, I come from Treaty 1 territory of the Cree and Dakota First Nations and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Global challenges relating to climate change um, are see, having us see mass displacement of populations, migration at unexpected times in unexpected ways, sustainable development challenges, and intersectional questions of gender, race, culture, all very much impacted by the economies that um, various governments and institutions are trying to manage in a time now of an unpredictable and seemingly unceasing pandemic. On the climate front, the melting of glaciers in the Himalaya creates a serious hydroelectric water management and agricultural challenges downstream. And we see in countries like Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, that the, with the many of the first serious and um, at times terrifying indicators of climate change are emerging in, in Asia. And governments across the region have responded with a range of initiatives, many of them in partnership with international agencies, development banks, private financing, and cross-government arrangements in the region and beyond. We're looking now at um, green financing projects and development assistance, some of which has a feminist orientation as Canada's does, with a focus on women and children and some of the disproportionate impacts that are occurring as we watch. This seminar examines the contents and context in which these changes are taking place and complex policy questions that they require. We have four questions that our panelists are going to be addressing as they see fit, and Professor Ramraj and I will weave ourselves into that discussion as we reach the discussion point after our panelists have, have been able to present. So I'm going to um, welcome our panelists, and I will be introducing them in the order of their speaking, um, but I'll just quickly summarize who's on the panel. Um, first, our first speaker will be Her Excellency Doma Sharing, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Bhutan to the UN, headquartered, of course, in New York. Our second speaker will be Dr. Patricia Galaval Tenez. She is the co chair of a study group of the International Law Commission on Climate Change and an adjunct senior research fellow at the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. And our third speaker will be Dr. Sue Zabo, who is the Director General of the Innovative and Climate Finance Bureau, 
and Global Affairs Canada here in Ottawa. The questions that we're going to be addressing um, are as follows, and I am, I'm certainly um, anticipating that our different panelists will choose a different emphasis and then we can explore together in the discussion. How is climate affecting living conditions in the South and Southeast Asia region in particular? And what are the social and human consequences that we're seeing now and that we can anticipate? Second, how are governments in the South and Southeast Asian region responding through national sustainability development policies um, in the context of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which are to run until 2030? And what are the gender dimensions of climate change? And how can governments respond in terms of foreign policy and development? And um, we will, of course, anticipate there'll be some reference to sustainable development goal number five on gender equality as we look at some of the intersections. And so uh, without further ado, let me thank everyone who's joined us today and ask Ambassador Charing if she would please begin her remarks. Morning, everyone, and thank you, Senator, for the kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ramraj for the invitation to join this uh, distinguished panel. And my appreciation similarly goes out to the University of Victoria and the Senate of Canada, our hosts this morning, for making it possible to share Bhutan's perspectives at this most timely event. Let me start by saying that uh, while I am based in New York, I have the great pleasure of also serving as Bhutan's ambassador to Canada. When I see how Canada conducts itself on the world stage here at the United Nations, as a leader of, in sustainable development, champion for multilateral cooperation, um, tireless advocate for gender equality, I couldn't be prouder of the growing partnership and cooperation between our two countries. As many of you know, Bhutan is a small country located on the southern slopes of the Himalayas between India and China. 71% of our country is under forest cover, far exceeding the 60% mandate uh, enshrined in our constitution. We have a network of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, biological corridors, which cover nearly 52% of our territory. We are also proud custodians of a remarkable array of biodiversity that includes 5,600 vascular plant species, more than 200 species of mammals, 770 bird species. And I might mention that dozens of these species are already on the endangered or globally threatened lists. Notably, Bhutan is also a net carbon sink. With our forests absorbing two thirds more carbon than we emit, Bhutan has already exceeded our international pledge to remain carbon neutral for all time. Today, we can proudly claim to be carbon negative. Achieving this has not been easy, for a resource constrained country like Bhutan, prioritizing the preservation of our environment as a national goal and as a global public good entails huge opportunity costs. Difficult choices have been made in order to ensure that our national policy decisions are pro-environment, respectful of our forests and biodiversity, sustainable and consistent with the shift to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. Many often question how this is possible. To this, I'd make three suggestions. First, uh, strong governance and policy environment is essential. Uh, we have, in Bhutan's context, gross national happiness, which is a multi-dimensional development approach that seeks to achieve a harmonious balance between uh, the uh, material well-being of our people, country and people, and the spiritual, emotional, and cultural needs of our society. This is what drives Bhutan's pursuit of sustainable development and progress. Uh, there is clear recognition of the interdependence of nature, human progress, and well-being. The pandemic, of course, has brought this reality into greater focus. And the protection of the environment is in fact featured as one of the pillars, one of the four pillars of gross national happiness. And any new policy or project before introduction by the government is vetted through a GNH policy screening tool. Second, uh, clear policies and effective legal frameworks. 
uh, inspired by the strong commitment of our monarchs to preserving our natural surroundings, promotion and protection of the environment, and safeguarding biodiversity is enshrined in Bhutan's constitution. Uh, the constitution further designates every Bhutanese as a custodian of the environment, which serves to formalize the sense of deep reverence to nature that is already embedded in the Bhutanese psyche. Uh, moreover, a number of policies, regulations, and strategies are, have been put in place in keeping with the core value of environmental conservation. Despite these successes and commitments, our environment and biodiversity in Bhutan is under threat. We face multiple challenges, like much of the developing world, uh, the global climate crisis, pressures of economic growth, shrinking fiscal space, and of course, the pandemic, uh, which has cast a long shadow on the health of our economy, has resulted in broad and deep disruptions across multiple key sectors, hitting the most vulnerable the hardest. These challenges present opportunities, and these opportunities call for collaboration and partnerships, which is the third essential facet to successful and ambitious pro-conservation policies. Um, and these partnerships, I'd like to emphasize, go beyond mere cooperation between governments, but encompass as well collaboration and international with international organizations, IFIs, private sector, civil society, including academia. Uh, let me conclude my remarks with one example I'm particularly proud of. This is the Trans-Bhutan Trail Project, which is undertaken by the Tourism Corporation of Bhutan and the Bhutan Canada Foundation. Uh, it seeks to resurrect an ancient trail that dates back to the 16th and 17th centuries. The trail formerly served generations of travelers um, as the main link between Eastern and Western Bhutan, spanning 430 kilometers over rugged terrain. With the introduction of the National Highway, the trail gradually fell into, uh, was abandoned in the 60s and 70s and was obviously reclaimed by nature. Uh, the project, which has been underway since the beginning of this year, optimizes Bhutan as an eco-tourism destination and during the pandemic has extended a critical lifeline to over 500 unemployed youth and tourism sector employees whose means of livelihood came to an abrupt halt with the closure of our borders in March. The project employs local communities of the nine districts and 28 blocks that the path traverses, um, the restoration of abandoned bridges across ravines along the trail also enhances connectivity between communities and broadens prospects for local economies. Uh, in short, I consider this to be an inspiring example of collaboration that is targeted, impactful, inclusive and responsive to national needs and circumstances. And um, I think it exemplifies ideal partnerships that can succeed and truly be impactful for not only at the national level, but at the community level. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you so much. I learned a lot from that presentation. Um, and I hope that I'll be able to reach out to you in the near future because I would love to have you engage with a whole range of senators would like, who would like to hear more. Um, and uh, in, in your capacity as ambassador to Canada, I think we would, we would love to welcome you at least virtually um, to the Senate of Canada. And now, if I may, um, I'd like to ask um, Professor Patricia Galvez-Teles to um, be our next speaker. Professor Galvez. Bonjour. Um, un grand merci pour uh, l'invitation d'être présent dans ce Victoria Forum. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir pour moi uh, d'être parmi vous um, aujourd'hui. Um, I will switch now to English, uh, but I could resist the French um, um, since Canada, uh, it's a, 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 a bilingual country and uh, a country for which I have great uh, admiration. Um, I'm uh, very grateful for the invitation uh, to be present today and to share some views uh, on this important um, topic of uh, climate displacement um, and uh, development, uh, especially with an emphasis on an Asia perspective. Uh, I am, as uh, Senator McFedrin said, um, I'm uh, currently 
um, a senior uh, researcher at uh, Singapore uh, at the Center for International Law um, of the National University of Singapore. Uh, but I am also a member of the International Law Commission, which is a commission um, uh, created by the United Nations uh, already 70 years or a little bit over 70 years ago to promote the uh, codification and the progressive uh, development uh, of international law. And I'm going to talk to you a bit also from that perspective. But um, as an academic, but also somebody who's involved in uh, um, uh, lawmaking, uh, which is what we do at the International Law Commission, lawmaking um, in terms of uh, preparing um, uh, drafts and principles and studies that then uh, member states at the UN, um, uh, like uh, uh, Bhutan, for example, and uh, I also um, take the opportunity to um, uh, say hello to Ambassador Chering and also uh, the other federal panelists. Uh, but I would like to uh, take a little bit of uh, time to explain a little bit how um, this um, uh, challenge of uh, climate change um, is affecting um, Asia in particular, but at the same time, of what kind of responses um, are being sought uh, for, not only at the national level, but also at the regional and uh, global uh, levels, because that's currently the focus uh, of my um, uh, research and my interest, not only, not only as an academic, but also as a member of the International Law Commission. And so it's also for me a great pleasure to be part of this forum that brings together um, academia and policymakers, which I think it's a very important um, way to mainstreaming uh, these issues um, and, 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 and put them also um, in the education context so that people are more aware and more informed um, of these uh, important issues and can also then influence their uh, political masters uh, for uh, change, for a better future, as it was said um, in the beginning. So um, in um, the talking, and I'll focus uh, mainly in questions one and two that uh, Senator outlined in the beginning, um, one of the um, adverse um, uh, effects of climate change um, is uh, the uh, issue of sea level rise, the question of the melting of the polar ice caps, the question of the melting of the Antarctica in particular, the issue of the warming um, of the ocean uh, is producing um, and will um, uh, uh, increasingly uh, produce an, uh, an increase in the mean sea level um, around the world. So this increase is not uh, exactly the same everywhere, uh, but uh, certain areas are certainly more impacted than others, and the projections are of a uh, global um, uh, increase of about one meter uh, as a mean sea level. So that means that in certain areas it will be less, but in other areas it will be longer. And this has, of course, a big impact for um, coastal communities, uh, for coastal communities and in particular in the Asia region. I'm not going to talk about the Pacific uh, because, of course, this is a major is issue for the small islands in the Pacific uh, region, but it's not just a matter for um, small island uh, developing states, although we hear a lot about that from that perspective, because there, there is uh, indeed until um, um, probably the end of the century or early next century, there is a risk of um, uh, states actually physically disappearing due to sea level rise. But it's an, uh, an issue that affects also the um, low-lying coastal states and there are many of those uh, in the Asia regions and many countries were already cited today like um, uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh um, or also Indonesia, Thailand and including Singapore uh, where the Prime Minister has recognized that sea level rise is a major issues and measures are being taken to adapt to sea level rise. So... Um, uh, quoting from uh, the IPCC, which is the UN uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the scientific body um, that um, uh, um, uh, is able to um, get uh, scientific information from a bit all over the world, and so the most authoritative uh, science basis there is really uh, an issue which is of a pressing nature, 
because the uh, low-lying coastal zones, uh, many of them in Asia, as I mentioned, uh, which are areas uh, 10 meters above, uh, less than 10 meters above sea level, um, are currently home to 600 million people, which is now at the moment uh, more than uh, 10% of the global population and um, projected to reach more than 1 billion by 250. And of course, many of these uh, populations are in Asia, in the countries that we mentioned. So it's a threat to coastal communities. It's a threat also uh, to major cities, uh, uh, some, some of those cities in Asia, like Shanghai, for example, uh, but also um, um, Jakarta in Indonesia, which has uh, already um, announced, um, uh, Indonesia has already announced plans to moving the capital, um, and not only, but also due to the sea level rise uh, to a different island in the country. So what happens when the sea um, level rises? It happens that, uh, it, 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 of course, it enters into land and it has an impact um, uh, of um, um, in agriculture on water access on food security on livelihoods including tourism and fisheries and uh, the alternatives for the country concern are mainly twofold the first one is uh, to try to take physical uh, measures to prevent um, uh, sea level uh, from entering into the mainland like uh, having less uh, coastal urbanization, protecting the coast, but of course, and this is, for example, what's happening in Singapore, but of course, uh, those measures are expensive and uh, certainly highly dependent on international cooperation and funding. And the other measure, uh, which is uh, effective, but also very difficult for the concerned populations is the uh, retreat of uh, the population, the relocation of population. So clearly uh, we have an issue here that affects uh, many people that will have to be seen in the long term and, and where um, more than just uh, looking at it from national uh, point of view, uh, there has to be uh, some kind of a global um, understanding, not, also, not only from the political or economical point of view, but um, especially uh, from the legal point of view um, with a legal uh, framework uh, for um, protecting uh, the human rights of uh, persons that have to be moved, relocated when, uh, the, um, uh, when, when sea level will uh, prevent them from staying uh, in their places. And if you do ask uh, anybody that lives in coastal areas, including in uh, Asia, but also in the Pacific Islands, uh, their first wish would be to remain in situ, but that's not going to be possible for uh, many cases. So uh, it's important that we build on a legal framework, and that's what we're trying to do at the International um, Law Commission by doing a study on sea level rise in international law uh, with a component on the protection of persons affected by sea level rise, and that's what I'm working on. And so I think one important uh, aspect for governments um, around the world is to try to build some uh, consensus uh, on this uh, legal framework um, in order to be able to have a, a good legal response also to, to this kind of phenomenon. So I'll stop my remarks here, but I'll look very much forward to uh, the discussion that will follow. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, um, Dr. galvel Tellez. And again, I learned a great deal from what you have just shared with us, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have with, with our panelists. Um, if I may now ask our third speaker, Dr. Sue Zabo, who is the Director General of the Innovative and Climate Finance Bureau of Global Affairs Canada, I think also here in Ottawa today. Dr. Zabo, please. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Senator Dumas-Fedrin, for that kind introduction. And it's a real privilege to be part of this exceptional panel today. And let me also extend my thanks to those hosting us today. I'm going to focus on the nexus of climate finance and gender and on the potential and the challenges of climate finance to impact gender norms and local livelihoods. And I've had the privilege to be at the center of Canada's development of a new five-year strategy for our international climate finance, which will run 2021 to 2026. And this has included consultations with a diverse group of domestic and international participants. One of the key themes in these consultations has been 
adaptation versus mitigation. And initially, I found that framing rather puzzling because we know the warmer the planet, the greater will be the adaptation needs. For instance, because of sea level rise, which Professor Tellich has just been speaking about, or more frequent heat waves. Precisely the kinds of events that hit vulnerable populations the hardest. But on reflection, I think the underlying question is really about whether the billions that are going into climate finance could actually exacerbate inequalities, particularly gender inequalities, if we allow climate rationale to fully eclipse all other goals. Now, Asia is certainly a region where these challenges are very stark because of its wide diversity. Um, we know Asia is home to a number of upper middle income countries and some of the planet's biggest GHG emitters, but it's also home to many least developed countries with challenging geographies that magnify the adaptation challenges they face and limited resources. Multiple measures also show that Asia has some of the widest gender differentials, particularly in terms of extremely limited economic opportunities for women. And recent reports like the Asia Human Development, Re Development Report of 2019 note that there are a new generation of inequalities which are coming to light under the shadow of the climate crisis. So Asia is where we need to get the balance right in terms of the use of scarce public sector dollars on the gender and climate nexus. So I'm gonna explore this a little bit with two areas large mitigation efforts, and local livelihood possibilities. First, on mitigation. Canada, with our feminist international assistance policy, has proactively taken a more comprehensive approach to mitigation projects, finding ways to integrate gender equality considerations. This is the approach we've taken with our C Canadian Climate Fund for the Private Sector in Asia with the Asian Development Bank. I'll just give one example of a project, um, and I'm going to choose the Spectra Solar Power Project in Bangladesh. As part of the project's gender action plan, women occupied 10% of the jobs in construction and 25% of the jobs in operations. Now, the absolute numbers are small, but women have historically been left out of traditional infrastructure fields. So this is a small step towards strengthening women's access to opportunities in sustainable infrastructure projects, and a small step towards changing the stereotypes of what is women's work and women's roles. And this is really critical because of future employment opportunities. A frequently cited report notes that bold climate action could create more than 65 million new jobs between now and 2030, compared to business as usual. And as part of a just transition, we can make choices with our funding, choices that can push in the direction of greater equality, greater gender equality in these millions of new jobs. But let me move on to my second point because I wanted to emphasize that one of the real challenges in Asia as well is small and medium enterprises, not particular to Asia, but Asia is very important in this because we know that SMEs make up more than 96% of all Asian businesses. And we also know that women are more concentrated at the smaller size and more vulnerable end of the enterprise spectrum. Moreover, SMEs in developing countries are often found in climate dependent sectors like agriculture, fisheries, and tourism. So their importance to economies, lives, and livelihoods around the world make SMEs a key part of successful adaptation to climate change and to supporting climate adaptation. This last point was emphasized in a number of the consultations that I referred to at the beginning of my remarks. In one of our roundtables in Indonesia, participants underscored the importance of mobilizing finance to support local efforts aligned with national climate priorities. 
They also emphasize using gender lens investing mechanisms to further align climate finance with gender goals and advocated for increased coordination between the private sector, civil society, and financing institutions. This does highlight a challenge. How can we ensure more options for funding that will lie between large-scale resources from global institutions like the Asian Development Bank and the very small-scale grant funding? We know these SMEs belong to that missing middle, and we need to better address some of those missing middle challenges. But let me leave my opening remarks here, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. Zabo, and, uh, and for the additional dimension that you've brought into the conversation. I think what we all share is an urgent sense of concern and commitment to address um, how we accelerate the trajectory that we all hope that we're on to zero carbon societies. And at this point, I would like to offer panelists, if you have a question of each other um, that you'd like to ask, um, and if so, please just jump in and address it to your co-panelist. I have so far one question that's come in online, and I'll turn to that um, after this part of the discussion. Yes, please, Dr. Zabel. Thank you. Um, I think both of my co-panelists spoke about some of the importance of local economies. Um, Ambassador Charing talked about the Trans-Bhutan Trail um, and how that has given greater economic opportunities during a pandemic. Um, and I think one of the things we know is that the COVID pandemic is actually heightening some of the challenges that are out there and that the economic dislocations mean this need for a green recovery and ensuring that local populations are able to indeed climb back from the economic dislocations are particularly important. So I wonder if I can ask my fellow panelists to talk a little bit more about some of those local economy effects and where they see um, that a green um, uh, recovery and a green response um, can actually help to bring some of those climate goals forward. Thank you very much. Uh, this table. Sue, thank you very much for the question. I'm glad you raised it because uh, obviously at this time that we, the international community is facing uh, the convergence of three crises in fact. Uh, the global, pan the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the economic recession, and of course, the climate catastrophe. And um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, uh, along with associated lockdowns and uh, other disruptions, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's having a very deep and broad impact on various sectors of our economy. Uh, in Bhutan, key sectors such as tourism, uh, construction, agriculture have been affected. And uh, obviously this has uh, thrown uh, large numbers of Bhutanese and communities um, into, uh, uh, has thrown into question their, their means of livelihood. Uh, on top of this, uh, we have, uh, in view of the public health situation in a number of other countries, in other countries, number of uh, Bhutanese nationals previously working overseas, primarily youth, uh, younger Bhutanese have uh, returned to Bhutan, and uh, this has compounded the already severe youth unemployment uh, situation in the country. Um, so yes, it, it, it is having a, a deep impact uh, among the recovery response and recovery measures. Uh, the government has uh, placed a great deal of emphasis on uh, upskilling, reskilling, training uh, the workforce in order to meet the needs and demands of, of, of our economy and our development aspirations. Um, I think that's why I'm so um, happy to point towards the Trans-Bhutan Trail, which so successfully uh, allows us to direct uh, the um, uh, uh, unemployed 
youth and uh, those previously working with uh, within the tourism sector to uh, other areas, sources of employment. Um, and I think uh, in, in this context, we, we really need to, it's imperative that we seize the opportunity. Well, of course, the pandemic has, has been very damaging for all countries uh, in Bhutan as well, but uh, it, we should recognize that it also presents an opportunity to, uh, for course correction. And uh, if we seize the opportunity to ensure that more investments are made in uh, green jobs and uh, uh, areas uh, of the economy that can take advantage of um, zero emissions technology, and uh, uh, I think that it, it would be a good start. Thank you so much, Ambassador Chering. And, and now I don't know whether um, Professor Galvo Tenez would like to respond as well, or whether I should move to a quest the first question, which as a matter of fact <laughs> is directed um, to you, um, Dr. Galvo Tevez. So perhaps I'll ask that question to you, and then if you wish to combine your, your response to the earlier question, that would be fine. The question that's come in is, um, does the world need a global vulnerability to disaster map and global relocation, resettlement and planned displacement law and or guidelines. And perhaps uh, this is in the work somewhere and I'll invite other, our other panelists to respond as well if you've got information to share in response to this important question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator, and thank you for the question. Um, I will take uh, just uh, 30 seconds to um, also address uh, the point that was uh, raised by um, Sue Zabo. Um, I'm not a, a finance um, expert. Um, I'm, my focus is uh, strictly or mostly legal, but it's uh, impossible not to be aware also of uh, um, a more holistic view. And, and what I can say on that is that um, um, it's indeed the, the, um, the countries that, well, first will have less uh, contributed to uh, the climate um, um, a change issue that are more affected. And they are also the ones that are um, normally less vulnerable that are more severely affected. And so, um, and especially in this case of a uh, global um, economic crisis uh, uh, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where many of these countries that are highly dependent on uh, tourism um, and, um, and other types of activities, uh, the issue of uh, financing um, comes at the forefront. So I think that's uh, why the issue of uh, international cooperation in its diverse forms, uh, not all, only in terms of you know, scientific technological support, uh, but also the financing for those measures of protection that are uh, the ones that should initially be sought, uh, like the fortification of the coast, uh, the land reclamation. Um, you, see, you see countries that have the capacity to do it, and Netherlands is probably the best example where they've lived uh, you know, with this problem all their life, uh, having um, you know, the whole country underneath the sea level. And so they have a large um, experience um, in, in terms of um, building fortifications around the coast but also the financial capacity to do it. And a country like Singapore uh, also has the capacity to do it. Uh, but then when you go uh, to least developed countries um, and uh, you do have a problem of uh, the financial, not only, I mean, the question of the equity and, and uh, the principle of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and the issue of uh, um, having a, a, a global fund for uh, fighting climate change and the, and the Warsaw mechanism, but, but you do see that you need um, some kind of an equi equity also to help uh, those countries uh, protecting because the other um, the consequence is that uh, people will have to move people have to be relocated if you cannot uh, protect the coast and that can generate not only internally displaced so people that are uh, forced to move um, in their own country but that could also uh, generate and there are impressive numbers in studies that are being done and projections that are being done where there are impressive numbers of people that will move abroad um, to third countries um, 
including uh, to Europe, North America, Canada. Uh, so I th it's a global problem. It's, a, it's not something that you can just tackle at the, at the local or regional uh, level. I think the whole community, international community, has to be involved in that. And, and, and this allows me a good segue to, to the question that was asked in the chat, uh, which is a very interesting uh, question about how uh, or whether uh, we should have a, a global uh, framework, a legal framework or guidelines uh, to deal with disasters. And this is what the project that I'm involved in, the International Law Commission, um, is trying to do. We are trying to look, I mean, the commission has done uh, already an initial um, uh, uh, draft convention, which is now uh, in the hands of states, because we don't, we are not the lawmakers per se. We are experts appointed uh, by states and elected in the General Assembly of the United Nations. And then we produce the preliminary uh, legal work, um, uh, technical work for then states to uh, take it up if they want um, in the form of a convention or of guidelines. Um, which is soft law, it's not binding instruments, but they carry a lot of uh, authority. And then later in a later period, they could be turned into, into a convention. And so the International Law Commission has worked on the issue of disasters before. And in 2016, we have prepared a set of draft articles that could be uh, could become an international convention on um, disasters in the related to the protection of persons in the event of disasters, uh, where, for example, um, slow onset events that are caused by climate change, like droughts and sea level rise, are also covered. But it focuses mostly on the um, on on the, on on the logic of um, disasters that have uh, you know strong impact impact, but they have uh, the consequences are not um, uh, long lasting in the terms um, uh, because for normally if if there's a hurricane, a typhoon, a tsunami, or an earthquake, uh, it could be possible for people to they may have to be moved. Um, around the country or to another place um, during a certain period, but then they will be able to go back uh, to their homelands. And it's very different when you look at sea level rise, which is probably uh, the um, adverse effect of climate change, uh, where it has the potential to really affect the three elements of the state, uh, what we consider to be a state, the population, the territory, and government, because in the most extreme uh, cases, like the cases of small islands in the Pacific and in, in, in the Indian Ocean, um, you may have a state disappearing. And so you may have to you know, displace population. You may have to um, lose um, uh, territory in terms of uh, you know, maritime zones but you may also have the disappearance of a statehood. So this is the big difference between sea level rise and other disasters is that this has really the potential to be irreversible um, and, and really affect um, uh, the possibility, um, which is something that uh, never happened in physically or uh, legally, politically, a state disappearing. We've seen many states being created, but we've never seen a state disappearing physically. So this is completely a, a, a new issue uh, for the international law community to deal with. And that's uh, why we think it's important uh, to have e either as a soft law instrument in the terms of guidelines uh, or maybe later um, uh, in a more binding instrument, some pr principles, um, especially um, in, in the case um, uh, concerning displacement uh, of people, um, principles that would protect the human rights of those uh, people that have to be relocated um, or they have to migrate abroad, um, and also a strong focus on uh, the duty of the affected state to protect their own population, but also of third states of the international community to come in um, in uh, helping uh, with the effort um, and, and perhaps also uh, taking in people if uh, the territory physically disappears or uh, if the state, uh, if, if people decide to migrate abroad. So um, we can... Uh, discuss a lot more about this. Is This is what we'll be doing in the International Law Commission, and I hope that uh, in a few years we'll have a study that states can act upon. Thank you so much.
Thank you, um, Professor galvel Telez, And I, I hope you're on social media so that people can start following you and that you do updates on, on the issues that um, you've addressed in such a, a comprehensive and succinct answer. Um, I have a number of questions that have come in and interestingly enough, they are very similar to a question that I know that our, our colleague and co-host, uh, Dr. Victor Ramraj, uh, has planned to ask. So I'm going to just ask you, Victor, please, if you would address our panelists now. Thanks, Senator McFedrin, and thanks uh, to the panelists for a uh, really stimulating discussion. Um, I, I have to say that I, I'm quite impressed with what I'm hearing from uh, Bhutan and Singapore in terms of uh, the government's response and how seriously they're taking uh, climate issues and sea level issues. Um, but when I, I look across the region, uh, it seems that uh, not all uh, governments are, are as committed. Um, they're, they're distracted by uh, political instability. They're distracted by other economic uh, concerns. Um, so I, I wonder, um, apart from engaging uh, governments uh, on these issues or intergovernmental organizations, and I think some of you have alluded to, uh, to this, um, strategy. I, I wonder if there are effective ways of engaging civil society organizations and other non-state actors uh, to address climate concerns when governments in, in the region, parts of the region, are either distracted or, or disinterested. Perhaps if um, no one else is jumping in, uh, would it be okay if I just jumped in with a, a couple of remarks on this, Senator McFedrin? Please do. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Zapp. Thank you. And I'd actually, Victor, that is a wonderful question. Um, and, you know, I'd like to kind of answer it in two parts. Um, you know, one, uh, one part of this, of course, is to make sure that we continue to work with those states who want to be De developing more ambitious um, NDCs and how we can support their capacity in doing so. Same with national adaptation plans. Um, how can we support that? And Canada has, through various um, different support to networks, um, supported those plans so that developing countries can themselves take ownership. But certainly, um, and one of the things we heard during our consultations was that ownership is not just at the level of a national government. We also needed to be thinking about subnational governments. We also need to be thinking about participation of different elements of society and how when we think about ownership, we think about different civil society groups, indigenous people, gender groups. So how do we actually broaden out um, those, those definitions of country ownership? And again, um, making sure that that's done in a way that continues to move forward what the country wishes to do in terms of its nationally determined contributions, but also to make sure that groups have voice in being able to look at specific circumstances because we know that in the end, a lot of the adaptation that has to take place has to be local. And that will be differentiated depending on the locality, but what shouldn't be so different is how we treat that, how we create participatory processes, inclusive processes, and how we ensure that our policies are there as the framework to make sure that we don't forget to do that kind of check-in and real engagement um, with, uh, with local groups. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Zabo. And I wonder if I could invite um, either of our other two panelists, Ambassador Schering or um, Professor Galvo Telez, if you had anything you wish to add to that response. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramraj. That's an excellent point that you raised. And um, I think following up on uh, what Suzo Zabo mentioned about the importance of uh, um, climate action, climate response being uh, inclusive, that really hits the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the principle of leaving no one behind. And really, you can only ensure that uh, vulnerable groups uh, 
uh, are are and and the most vulnerable countries as well are are not left behind, left out of sustainable development. Uh, if uh, they are given a voice, if they are able to participate in decision-making processes, um, if they are an integral part allowed to contribute uh, to the planning process, participate and engage in implementation, and also be part of uh, monitoring and evaluation at the end. Um, and this holds not only for uh, when you speak at the level of countries, uh, including the most vulnerable amongst us, like LDCs, um, but also uh, various segments of society. And here, uh, one of the points, the main themes of this entire panel discussion was uh, to bring in the gender perspective. And you can also include um, women among the, the obviously, the, the vulnerable groups and uh, the segments of society that are hardest hit and carrying the burden of um, climate change. I think it's very interesting that um, in, in uh, Bhutan, we, it was quite clear, uh, according to various gender analysis uh, studies that were conducted on the impact of climate change uh, in, in, within our society, uh, it was quite clear to see the uh, differentiation between the impacts borne by men and women, and overall, women in Bhutan, at the, the respondents indicated their view that um, their work burden had, in fact, increased as a result of um, climate change. They reported uh, 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 impact on uh, the levels of food production, uh, increase in occurrence of pests and uh, human wildlife conflict. Um, in fact, uh, they also rep reported on uh, um, increasing vulnerability to uh, uh, f for of women and girls to, to sexual violence uh, uh, as a result of out migration of males to from rural to urban areas uh, within the country. And um, overall, uh, well, they also reported that, um, as I think one of our panelists had mentioned this earlier, that there was also an impact on um, uh, uh, what was it the 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 essential um, inputs into their means of livelihood uh, uh, in the agriculture sector and uh, strains on um, increasing strains on household income and necessary changes being inflicted on. Um, household food habits. Um, so from our perspective, we do see that women are more deeply and heavily impacted by the impacts of climate change. And um, I think that points um, to a greater need to ensure that women are um, uh, incorporated, are, are involved and included in, in all aspects of um, climate response. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And if I could just ask um, Dr. Gavel Tellez um, whether you had anything to add. And if so, um, I would just ask if it could be fairly brief so that we could move to our next question. Thank you. Avec plaisir. Um, first thing to respond to you, I am on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also follow the work of the International Law Commission on the website. Uh, of the International Law Commission, which you can Google and find easily. So sorry for the publicity, but uh, in response to your question. Uh, the other issue to respond to Professor Ramja, um, a very interesting question, and to take a different perspective, um, how to involve, um, if governments are not acting, um, how can civil society and non-state actors um, act and prompt uh, governmental action? I mean, we see in some countries, especially in the Pacific, where it's such an existential threat that governments are very aware. But it's true that maybe in some other areas of the world, they're not so aware and action is slower. Um, and in particular, with regard to the Paris Agreement uh, targets and the NDCs. So um, what from the legal uh, side, what we are seeing now is that there is increasing um, climate litigation. So um, 
uh, going um, to uh, national courts. Um, there have been very important cases in uh, the Netherlands, Ireland, Colombia, and also at the regional level, at the re uh, European Courts uh, of Human Rights and the Inter-American Courts. Um, also in Asia, there's a very interesting case uh, before the, it's not a court case, it's uh, before the Human Rights Commit Commission in the Philippines, uh, where um, a number of uh, uh, people from civil society, they've tried to bring a claim uh, linking the actions of the big um, uh, oil companies uh, and linking the, that to the responsibility uh, for uh, one of the hurricanes that uh, produced an um, uh, enormous uh, impact. Uh, so it's very interesting also to see this dimension of uh, climate litigation um, that comes essentially through human rights channels because it's where you have the institutional uh, machinery and, and where you have um, also very strong, uh, more than gender, I would say, youth perspective, because you're also having a number of cases that are being brought uh, by young people, um, including against Portugal in the U European Court of Human Rights recently, uh, but also uh, before the com uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, uh, where there's a, a, court, a, a case going on um, at the moment uh, brought by um, uh, 16 uh, children, including Greta Thunberg, uh, against five uh, different governments for uh, the governments not doing enough to combat climate change. So I just wanted to bring this uh, legal perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would actually like to, I understand from um, Dr. Ramraj that he has a, a follow-up question, so I'm going to invite him to raise that now. Dr. Ramraj. Actually, the, the, the panelists uh, quite comprehensively uh, addressed my question. So I, I see there are a few questions in the chat. Um, I, I'm happy to, uh, to defer to, to those questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I, I think that um, one of the previous questions that was really asking about research that is at the meta level, um, overview uh, as well as predictions, I'm going to um, combine some of the points that have been raised in the, uh, in the chat by pointing out that um, I think in each in her own way, each speaker has addressed the issue of disproportionate impact and disproportionate burden. And that um, we often see that a disproportionate burden is carried by those with fewer resources. And um, as we think about all the various ways, locally, regionally, globally, that we need to be seriously changing in order to get on and stay on a trajectory for a zero carbon societies. I'm going to note that much of the commentary and tentative research, because we're only at this point uh, less than a year into this pandemic, but much of the commentary is indicating that the disproportionate burden that has been referred to by a number of panelists borne by women in societies, um, that burden is actually being predicted now as not being lifted entirely in the foreseeable future. In other words, there are setbacks that have already occurred largely as a result of the nexus between climate change um, and the pandemic that are exacerbating and have exacerbated gender-based inequalities in different ways, but across our globe. And I wonder if um, each panelist might want to be able to respond and to the extent that there's a financial component that you're aware of, because much of the burden that we're talking about is at least exacerbated, if not generated, by financial and economic disparities. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McFedrin. Um, I think uh, that as, as uh, I had mentioned earlier and, and um, other panelists had also addressed, I, I do agree that um, impacts necessarily differ on men and women because of their differential roles, uh, vulnerabilities, and their uh, respective capacities, coping capacities as well. 
and uh, it's quite clear that uh, the impacts of um, climate change continue to overly burden uh, women in particular and increase their their workload and expose them to greater vulnerabilities. Um, there is also a very clear linkage between SDG 5, uh, gender equality, and uh, uh, SDG 13. Um, and um, I think, um, well, in the case of Bhutan, uh, it's not so much a case of, uh, the challenge is not so much political will. Uh, we have the will, we have the policies, we have the institutions, but uh, what I hear more frequently from national agencies at the national level is uh, uh, challenges of resources and human capacity. So um, yes, resource constraints are a problem, financial as well as human. And I think that's where uh, the importance of international cooperation and international solidarity comes in. Uh, in that regard, um, I would like to mention here that um, ongoing cooperation with uh, the Canadian government has been um, very helpful in this direction uh, because Canada follows such a strong um, feminist foreign policy, which uh, also has a strong focus on um, uh, pro-climate projects and and um, and um, and and on youth. Uh, that uh, any undertaking that uh, we pursue in collaboration with. Uh, Canadian partners are uh, always have an emphasis into these um, important um, aspects, uh, and uh, through some of the projects, uh, the cooperation projects that are underway right now, uh, we are quite assured that these are areas that are receiving attention in in Bhutan. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, may I invite uh, either Dr. Zabo or um, Professor uh, galville Chalez to respond as well? Sure, I'd be happy to um, jump in. Um, you know, this is, this is a, one of the most important questions of our time, I think, because we know that um, there's the, the talk of COVID reversing decades of development gains. Um, but what this reminds me of is a, um, a cartoon, Pictures Speak a Thousand Words, I'm going to try and describe it, but it's a person looking down at a small monster called COVID and saying, thank goodness we beat that, while behind them stands a giant monster looming over, and that is the climate crisis. Um, and what that means is that we really need to learn from this COVID crisis, what has galvanized the world to act on this crisis that we can then think about for this slow onset climate emergency. So where are some of the places where we can try to leverage some of the, uh, some of the ways in which we are moving forward? Um, I think that's a very live question, and I'm just going to bring out two, um, two points uh, for the moment. One, we've often, in the climate world, we talk about adaptation, we talk about mitigation. I think in the world where we're reversing development gains, we really have to look much more deeply at where we have co-benefits. Where is it that we can work at the intersection of adaptation and mitigation? And quite frankly, where does our global architecture help or hinder us in that respect? Because the global architecture pushes us towards counting things as one or another and we really have to start thinking about where the architecture and the metrics can help us rather than potentially holding us back. The second point I would mention um, in terms of the leveraging point, and it was mentioned earlier um, by, um, by my two fellow panelists, is on nature-based solutions. Um, and again, here are ways in which we can try to look at how we move towards a green recovery in ways that really try not to destroy but to sustain, in ways that we can really look at how nature can actually be and be counted as the asset 
that it is. And this is particularly important when we talk about gender equality as well, because we know that so many women are involved, whether it's in agriculture or fisheries um, or in mangroves, for example, these are all very, they have very, very important um, gender equality dimensions. Thank you. Professor Galvo Tellez, do you wish to respond? <laughs> Just, just, just very briefly. I mean, in my um, research um, that is now starting, uh, starting, and so this is all very preliminary. When I'm going to look at um, uh, the legal um, uh, framework that could be devised to um, uh, set out a number of principles uh, that uh, protect uh, people affected by sea level rise, so in particular uh, about sea level rise, but I think this could be replicated in in other. Um, uh, um, uh, impacts uh, of uh, climate change because you also have the question of drought and desertification and, and other impacts. And when I uh, when I will look at the human rights framework, uh, of course, it will be very important to look um, at the question of uh, the vulnerable groups like women and um, children. I think that will be very important for me to uh, develop that aspect because as we see um, in any situation, uh, whether it's war, uh, whether it's a um, situation of social unrest, of poverty, of uh, um, uh, climate change, of uh, pandemics, um, uh, women tend to be uh, most uh, hardly hit uh, by uh, crisis and by difficult situations. So I will look um, in particularly into this aspect when uh, trying to build um, a good uh, human rights framework for that. Thank you to all three panelists. Um, I'm just going to observe that Ambassador Sharing made reference to the interconnection between the SDG 5 on gender equality and SDG 13. And I'm going to, it's, it's short, I'm going to just read it. The, uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 13 is to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And one of the targets that is specified under this SDG is to strengthen resilience and adaptive capacity to climate-related disasters. And I would add to that to the planning and preventive actions in terms of disasters. And I want to add to that a question that's, uh, that's come in actually from uh, Professor Jituni, um, which is a question about the private sector and any examples or policies or um, wishes, dreams about further engagement, deeper engagement with the private sector to take a stronger role, stronger collaborative role in addressing climate and displacement issues, because of course, displacement is another one of the indicators, one of the measurements um, for testing resilience around SDG 13. So um, if we could have some commentary, please, on private actors, the private sector, be they uh, corporate or otherwise, be most welcome. Um, Dr. Zabo, perhaps. Sure, I'm happy to, uh, to jump into this. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to um, bring up uh, maybe three points on this. One is um, we certainly very much take to heart that the, um, the goal of uh, ensuring sufficient climate finance is not just a public sector goal, but it also needs to raise private sector um, funding and engagement because we'll never turn around economies unless the private sector is really turning around as well. One of the things that we looked at um, was the whole role of insurance um, and particularly with with respect to extreme weather events. Um, and we've been talking about extreme weather events here during this panel as well. Um, Canada, for that reason, decided to join the high-level consultative group of the INSU Resilience Global Partnership. Um, that has a very long name, but essentially it's a network of donor countries, country partners, civil society, and insurance practitioners from the private sector who are trying to look at more timely and reliable disaster response using climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. 
Um, we actually co-chair the um, Into Resilience Global Partnership Gender Working Group as well. And I think this is important because one of the elements that it illustrates, um, in, in addition to the important aspect of insurance, but it also illustrates that it's not just about the private sector funding, it's also about the private sector bringing its expertise um, and how that expertise um, that may be developed in, um, uh, in, in more rich countries can now be brought to bear and adapted because it must be adapted um, for uh, developing countries. And I would say at the sovereign level, so the country level, but also how we can bring that down and be thinking about the kinds of micro insurance products, for example, as well um, for households. And then the second um, part of that then becomes what is the private sector? Because we often think about the private sector in these very large terms, the large players internationally. But of course, the private sector is also local. Um, and how do we also strengthen um, the local private sector um, in order to be able to respond to disasters? Uh, and we've had some interesting projects that we've done um, through Canadian international assistance. Uh, for example, um, a project on re building through micro insurance and women's micro enterprises in the Philippines, um, where we've really tried to look at how we can support the economic recovery of micro entrepreneurs and their families to disasters, um, and also increase their resilience, which of course is particularly important for a country like the Philippines because it's rated within the top five um, index of most disaster prone countries in the world. Thank you. So th there was a, a follow-up question that was sent to me uh, privately uh, regarding uh, investment laws and, and whether in some countries uh, investment laws need to be changed to allow private sector investments uh, in the green economy. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to throw that out. Uh, there, there was also another question uh, from a solar, solar engineer um, asking about uh, investments from Western Canada and what uh, – uh, Canadian companies uh, could do. So uh, th this does um, I engage questions about a shift to, to the a green economy, but perhaps with the involvement of uh, external actors. And, and I wonder, um, in fact, all, all of the panelists, if, if this is something that you, you think would be welcome uh, in, in the region or should be encouraged, uh, that there's been a lot of focus uh, uh, appropriately, I think, uh, on, on sort of local uh, actors and and uh, SMEs and and, uh, um, and the role of women in in the region uh, as entrepreneurs, uh, but uh, but I wonder if there is uh, a role for uh, foreign actors and foreign uh, investment. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ramraj. I'm going to just do a bit of a time check here um, to remind all of us that we have about six minutes left for this portion of, the, of our program. We're nearing the end. So I'd like to use this time to invite each panelist to um, certainly respond to the question that was just raised by Dr. Ramraj, but also to use approximately two minutes um, for any closing comment that you wish to make um, as we bring this open discussion to a close as part of this panel. Thank you so much. And if we could start please with Ambassador Sherry. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, in concluding, I would like to circle back to our response and recovery efforts from uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think it's important to recognize that uh, the pandemic has brought us to an inflection point and that we must seize the opportunity provided by this inflection point to uh, undertake course correction towards a future that is green, sustainable, inclusive and more resilient. This is the time to try and build back better and to ensure that our recovery plans will provide a pathway to a green and sustainable economy that produces green jobs and prosperity, uh, reduces emissions, builds resilience. Um, and uh, in these efforts, the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda must continue to serve as our compass 
towards recovery. Um, it's said that trillions of dollars are being spent or are going to be spent on uh, recovery from COVID. And I think in that respect, it's uh, terribly important that we ensure that fiscal measures are aimed towards a green transformation of our economies and economic development. Um, again, as I said, uh, Investments need to be made in, in green jobs, zero emission technologies and infrastructure. Um, as the SG has, Secretary General of the United Nations has uh, pointed out in his six point strategy, uh, Bhutan also supports that there should not be any bailouts uh, from these measures for polluting industries and that all fossil fuel subsidies must be removed. And we think it's very important that we, um, as, as uh, recovery plans are being charted out, that policies and decisions must be screened through a climate lens. And of course, we would continue to advocate that uh, international community must continue to support uh, poorest countries uh, in their efforts to combat the impacts of climate change uh, with balanced support to both adaptation and mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And now um, for response and closing comment, please, to uh, Professor Galvo Tellez. Thank you so much um, to um, follow up from uh, Ambassador Sharing's remarks and also to pick up uh, uh, what um, uh, Dr. Suzabo just uh, said a bit earlier. Um, the UN Secretary General um, said recently that um, COVID-19 pandemic was a dress rehearsal for um, the global climate uh, crisis. So I think this is a, you know, an important wake up call. Uh, we see the difficulties we're in now. Um, and, and I would like to emphasize that, um, you know, scientists have been telling us uh, that there's still time to act, but this is the critical decade. The next 10 to 15 years is really the critical decade. It's where the Paris Agreement will have to uh, be implemented um, it's where the um, SDGs um, have to continue to be implemented and, and so where um, all um, action, be it from uh, uh, political, economic, but also uh, the development of legal tools uh, to address these issues have to be developed. So uh, my uh, last remark is one of that, one of a sense of urgency. Uh, I think we um, have seen from the pandemic, um, I normally say to my students when I teach international law that uh, international law is uh, always one war late. I think this time we were one pandemic late and certainly we don't want to be one climate crisis late because that would be too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Galvel Tellez. And uh, to our um, final panelists, Dr. Suzabo, please. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it'd be easy just to agree wholeheartedly with what uh, my fellow panelists have just said and perhaps end it there um, because I wholeheartedly agree with what they do, what they just said. Um, but perhaps I'll just make three very quick remarks. Um, first, responding to the question, um, certainly Canadian leadership um, in terms of Canadian companies. Canadian leadership isn't just about what the public sector does. It's also about leadership of Canadian companies. And this is something we heard during our cross Canada consultations. And we're certainly looking at how we can pursue that in our next round of international climate finance. Secondly, um, you know, as part of this panel, I would say that climate rationale, of course, needs to be our first and foremost guide for our climate finance efforts. But we also need to choose to look at how our climate finance can address inequalities and in particular gender inequalities on the path to low carbon sustainable economies and societies, because that path has now become steeper and rockier due to COVID-19. But it's not only what we do, and I think as this discussion has really emphasized, it's also about how we do this. Um, and I really appreciate that our discussion has emphasized the need to engage local communities, different populations, including youth voices, um, and to support agents of change. Thank you. 
Dr. Zabo, thank you very much. This is my opportunity to express genuine admiration, appreciation, and respect for all our panelists and all our questioners, the high level of engagement that we've had, and for the learning that we've shared together. And I would now, um, with those words of appreciation, step away from being the moderator and ask the vice chair of the virtual Victoria Forum, um, Dr. Adele Gitoni, to uh, close the panel. Thank you. Hi, it is my, my pleasure to uh, have you. And uh, uh, it is, I'm trying to fight my video. It's not turning on because it seems to be stopped. But uh, anyway, I guess you, you hear me. Um, it is, uh, on behalf of the Victoria Forum, it is my honor and pleasure to thank uh, this panel and uh, the insight that we, we, we learned from you. Um, I am uh, Adel Gitoni, I am professor with the Faculty School of Business, and I am um, also the Associate Co-Chair of the Victoria Forum. Um, this webinar brings to the end our uh, series of webinars for 2020. And uh, this last webinar uh, was put together, thank you to the championship of uh, Professor Victor uh, Ramraj uh, uh, from University of Victoria. Uh, the partnership with, uh, so throughout this uh, series of webinars, uh, since we started the pandemic, uh, we, we have built a number of partnership and this last webinar was not an exception. So uh, we thank uh, the Center for Asia Pacific Initiative mainly for, for really leading uh, this effort and uh, the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria for promoting uh, the webinar. Um, so just to give you uh, an overview of all the webinars we had so far, uh, so we started um, on the given actually an overview of all the different divides that we are suffering uh, when we started this series in, in webinars in uh, beginning of June or the end of May of 2020. Uh, we talked about cities, we talked about racism, inequalities, we talked about the uh, role of sports for bridging divides. Uh, we also addressed the issues um, related to multilateralism um, and the role of multilateral organizations like the UN. Uh, we discussed uh, the role of data in, in, in uh, informing our decisions, in especially about uh, the different divides. Um, uh, on a eu une conversation sur le, le Great Reset avec une participation euh, euh, distinguée de, de la Banque mondiale et puis du euh, FMI et la Banque du Canada. Uh, we talked about the uh, globalization and the future of globalization. Uh, we talked about the future of doing business and banking. Uh, we last uh, webinar was about the gender divides and uh, it was a very interesting conversation. And we finish it today with the climate displacement and development and the perspective of Asia. I can say uh, that it's not unique to Asia. It is some, something that we, we have seen um, in other places. On a eu l'honneur d'avoir au moins huit sénateurs um, du Sénat du Canada uh, impliqués à travers toute cette série. Uh, on a eu des, des, des membres de la Chambre des Lords uh, UK. Uh, we had a cross section of think leader, policy makers, business leaders, diplomats, uh, civil society representative who came across, um, uh, came and shared with us their knowledge, their insight, and more importantly, actually um, solutions and, in, uh, and insights about um, maybe a better future for all. Uh, so all of these webinars and the Victoria Forum uh, uh, are organized in partnership um, between the University of Victoria and the Senate of Canada, which is a historical partnership, and we are really proud of this, and with the support of TELUS and Van City, who are our, our strong partners and, and, um, uh, and founding partner making this really happen. Um, I would like to pitch uh, the virtual Victoria Forum that is happening in about two weeks from now. 
So in less than a week from now, there will be the U.S. election. And uh, two weeks from now, it is the Virtual Victoria Forum. So these are the, the most important uh, events on my calendar. Uh, so I hope uh, you can join us, register. There are a number of uh, roundtable and discussion um, that we have put together. And the purpose of the Victoria Forum is to articulate uh, some of what we heard throughout these webinars in terms of solutions and recommendations that we can move forward uh, to policy makers, to decision makers, to us as individual, what we need to change, to us as education institution to be able to integrate some of those um, uh, lessons in our teaching or to research questions because some of the issues that are facing us, we don't have answer to. So we need actually to uh, work together and collaborate. I am also proud to say that just throughout these webinars, we have built partnership with more than 22 different organizations from around the world. And we had participants from at least 30 different countries. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope you will continue the engagement with the Victoria Forum.